love seeing Republicans attacking each other. It's fine to contrast issues, but I want to keep focused on what our pledge was, which was beat Biden. He's scared. He is just a couple of steps away from that jail cell closing behind him. These indictments are a disaster for the country. Hi, everyone from Washington. I'm Scott McFarland, and welcome to America Decides History Tomorrow, the first Republican presidential debate of this historic 2024 cycle. Eight podiums will be on the stage in the arena in Milwaukee, which will, by the way, will be the city that hosts the 2024 Republican National Convention. Those are the eight candidates who will be there. The front runner, the former President Donald Trump, will not. Let's get on the ground in Milwaukee right away. Robert Costa and Finn Gomez, both there, 24 hours before this debate. I want you both to answer this question. Bob, let me start with you. How does it feel different if it does, 24 hours before the debate without Donald Trump attending tomorrow? Scott, good to be with you and here with Finn in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's clear there's a lot of anticipation here about what's going to happen on Wednesday evening. So many of the rival campaigns have high expectations that they can try to have a breakthrough moment. Many of them need a breakthrough moment to generate interest, sustained interest from donors, from supporters in early states. And so while it might not be the most high stakes debate in terms of the overall race because Trump is in such a front running position, for many of them, this is a night of survival. Can they actually endure in the Republican presidential race? And if you're someone like Governor Doug Burgum, who is at 1% or your former Vice President Mike Pence, who's in the single digits, you really could use a breakthrough moment, even if it's just underscoring your biography to much of the Republican electorate. Yeah, I mean, for a lot of these folks, this is the first time, the first opportunity they have to make a name for themselves, to really, to really declare to the audience of potential Republican viewers that this is my platform, this is what I stand for. Uh, I think in a, a cycle that's been dominated by Trump, uh, the former president, and his, in, in his uh, legal hurdles and troubles, uh, I think this is uh, a moment where they can have those break, breakthrough moments where they're, where they're hoping. And some of them uh, may have just a few minutes compared to like some of the others. You know, they, they just have a couple windows uh, before, uh, you know, before this the cycle is probably overtaken again just the next day by, by Trump uh, and, his, and his legal hurdles in, in Atlanta. And it's also, Scott, a, a, I would say, too, Finn, a, yeah. a reckoning for the Republican National Committee. We saw David Bossie, who's yeah. one of the organizers of this debate for the RNC, walking around. Who runs the party? Who really is the chairman of the party, the chairperson of the party? Ronna McDaniel, in name, is, and she runs the Republican National Committee. But when you have the front runner in the party decide not to show up at the party's debate and not to sign the pledge to protect the eventual nominee... It raises questions about political capital inside the GOP. And while Trump is close to McDaniel, he's close to Bossy, his former deputy campaign manager, yeah. he's saying to them, I don't need you. Right. I don't need to be there. And it will be a real question in the newsrooms around the country and for the Republican voter. What's the big event of the week? Is it the Republican debate or is it Trump expected to surrender later this week in Fulton County, Georgia? And Trump's bet based on my reporting, my conversations with his associates and allies and advisors, is that he believes his voters care more about him being defiant on Thursday than being on the stage on Wednesday. Yeah, and, you know, I think it's an interesting note. Uh, David Abbasi, yeah, his former, his former deputy campaign manager, essentially, in 2016. And also, you know, he handpicked Ronna McDaniel. You know, she's at that helm. And both, you know, I, we know that we have confirmed that that Ronald McDaniel went down, went up to Bedminster to, to personally plead with the former president to to attend this debate, and he and that he's not debating. And, 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 and frankly, have we, have we ever seen this, Bob? I mean, the, where you have the front runner with such a wide margin uh, not showing up to this debate when typically it would be all eyes on him at this debate. But I mean, it's so it's early. Kind of I mean, that's the thing. You think about 1992 presidential race. Bill Clinton didn't get into that race until the fall of 91. Right. So we're at a, such an early moment. I remember you and I were covering uh, the 2012 presidential race. Yeah. Who had the big debate in 2012 in the summer? Michelle Bachman, the congresswoman from Minnesota. She had a big debate. She won the uh, Ames straw poll. Yeah. It was the summer of Bachman. She didn't end up winning Iowa. She didn't end up winning the Republican nomination. So we have to be careful this is an important moment at this stage in the race, but it might not be that big of a moment long term. We're not trying to tell you not to care. It's important yeah. as a political yes. marker. But in the long term story of this presidential race, it's the first inning. Yeah. And, you know, there's still just, just and less than 150 days away until the Iowa caucuses, which is actually a lifetime, as you know, Scott, 
in politics. So a lot could still happen. But uh, tomorrow night, I think, really is uh, a new chapter in this cycle. And we're really going to hear from a lot of this field. Uh, and and this, a lot of this field will get a chance to really present themselves uh, to the country and potential Republican voters. Without Trump, it's Ron DeSantis, to a degree, literally and metaphorically, who's center stage. Before I ask you a question about the Florida governor, let's take a listen to what he said earlier today. 2024 is our moment of choosing. We are not going to get a mulligan on this one. The Democrats are playing for keeps. The time for excuses for Republicans is over. We must get the job done. Based on your conversations and reporting, Bob, you first, is it expected that the political fire will be trained on Ron DeSantis by the others? Or are his numbers so soft now that he needn't be targeted? A lot of this is going to depend on the question and the moment. I spoke to former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie in recent weeks, spent a day with him at the Jersey Shore, not the worst place to spend a day, at Seaside Heights. And Christie said he, he's, his ire, his target is Trump, even if Trump's not on the stage. But he'll be willing to take on DeSantis if, if it comes to that. But Florida governor, the Florida governor is at a point in the race where he may need to actually stretch his own political muscles and, and really make a case for his own record in Florida, maybe take on someone like Vivek Ramaswamy, who's garnering a lot of support among Trump voters. A debate super PAC memo was circulated uh, right. in DeSantis's orbit. Leaked, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, and it shows that some DeSantis allies believe he should be taking on Ramaswamy more than anyone because DeSantis has been attacking Trump from the right, but that has created some vulnerability with the Trump electorate to some extent. And Ramaswamy has moved up, if you look at some of those national polls, I mean, in the last few weeks, and really taking away, as DeSantis has slid, you've seen Ramaswamy move up. Uh, so that would be that would be a very interesting dynamic to see that Vivek Ramaswamy versus Ron DeSantis uh, tomorrow night. But, but I do think, and speaking to some uh, of the uh, of the rival campaigns to DeSantis, that, that that Ron DeSantis should have like basically a bullseye on his chest because he will be. Uh, you should expect a lot of of, uh, of rhetorical missiles to be fired at the Florida governor, and I do expect that he will be a prime target for the rest. They got to clear him out. They got to clear out the number two spot to be the chief alternative to Donald Trump, even if it's a wide margin. The person that's in their way right now is Ron DeSantis. So expect that. I would expect that. Uh, you know, some some of the others, like we mentioned, Vivek Ramaswamy, Chris Christie may throw some. Some some uh, some fireballs at, uh, at at Ron DeSantis as well. I mean, it come from it could come from all sides, from the right, from the left, from the center. So I think he will be a prime target uh, tomorrow night, Scott. The depths of summer and it's 78 degrees outside the arena in Milwaukee. Enjoy that, <laughs> both of you, Bob Costa, Finn Gomez. We appreciate it. It's a beautiful night tonight. Coming up, history of another site, another type on Thursday. Donald Trump expected to be fingerprinted booked and processed at the jail in Atlanta. Some of his co-defendants made some provocative moves late today. Nicole Killian's on the ground. She joins us next. Welcome back to America Decides. The former president and 18 co-defendants have until 12 p.m. Eastern time Friday to turn themselves into authorities on charges related to the alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election in Georgia. Two of those co-defendants did so today. Conservative attorney John Eastman and bail bondsman Scott Graham Hall. They've already surrendered to Fulton County authorities. Let's go to Fulton County. CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian is there. Nicole, first of all, describe what it was like when John Eastman, this figure who became so prominent in the January 6th investigation, showed up to turn himself into authorities. Yeah, that's right, Scott. I mean, look, we actually were expecting Eastman to surrender tomorrow, Wednesday. So he actually did it a day earlier than expected. And it was first thing this morning and not long after that other defendant, uh, Scott Hall. Uh, the other surprising thing is that in addition to his attorney sending out a statement, he actually stopped and spoke to reporters as he exited the jail. Here's what he had to say. I am confident that when the law is faithfully applied in this proceeding, all of my co-defendants and I will be fully vindicated. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, very much. 
Eastman posted bond of $100,000. Those were the terms set in the agreement uh, that was reached uh, between his attorneys and that of the district attorney. But as you mentioned, Scott, certainly uh, one of many uh, prominent figures in this case. Uh, he was one of the alleged architects of the former president's alleged strategy to try to overturn the 2020 election. Uh, at this point in time, uh, obviously, we're still waiting for other defendants to surrender. But of course, the biggest name that everyone is tracking is that of the former president who is expected to surrender here on Thursday. Let's take a moment and show the images of these 19 defendants in this unique prosecution in American history. Today's events underscore that some of them are new names to Americans. John Eastman, Scott Hall, but as you said, Nicole, the most prominent, expected to show up Thursday, the former president of the United States. What do we know about the timetable or the processes to expect on Thursday there in Fulton County? Well, the Fulton County Sheriff's Office has made clear that there will be a hard lockdown in this area. Of course, the jail is kind of sandwiched between this industrial zone and a residential neighborhood. Uh, so they have warned, for instance, that streets may be shut down uh, around this area. And we also know from the Fulton County Sheriff's Office that uh, he will process and his department will process the former president and all of these defendants in the same way, which could potentially include fingerprinting, which could potentially include the former president having to get his mug shot taken. Also, this is different because it's happening at a jail, not at a courthouse where we have seen the president uh, have to do uh, some of these uh, maneuvers and procedures uh, before. Uh, but that being said, uh, you know, I think it's worth noting that most of these defendants uh, are complying in the sense of trying to reach a bond agreement with the district attorney, you know, planning to surrender before the end of the week. But there's one defendant, a former White House chief of staff, Mark Meadows, who late today asked for an extension to surrender. And the district attorney basically slapped that down, saying that she is not going to grant any extensions and that she has given all of these defendants two weeks to surrender, that she's been very gracious about that, and that if he doesn't show up, she will file in a warrant for his arrest after noon on Friday. And just a few moments ago, at the federal courthouse in Atlanta, judges ordered Bonnie Willis to respond to Mark Meadows' request to do so by tomorrow afternoon. Um, the hearing Mark Meadows expects in this request to move it to federal court is Monday, 10 a.m., same time as a big hearing in D.C. in Trump's case here in Washington. I mention that because it's unclear to me when everybody else, those other famous names, Rudy Giuliani, Jenna Ellis, will surrender. From the vantage points you've been given, Nicole, can you see people going in or out of the jail, or have they moved everybody far enough away where it's invisible to you? Yeah, we're pretty much at a distance. I mean, as you can see behind me, probably you can just see the sign and that's about all. And that's pretty much all that we can see here ourselves. You know, the jail is set pretty far back away from the street, uh, but we are outside of one of the entrances that is typically used for the intake process. There's another uh, main entrance for the jail. And so uh, really it's just about kind of keeping eyes out for convoys that may be coming, you know, back and forth uh, through throughout uh, the jail and uh, these checkpoints. Um, other than that, you know, the sheriff's office has been transparent in the sense of when individuals are booked. Uh, they are posting that information, although we have yet to see a mugshot uh, from the two individuals who surrender today, uh, John Eastman and Scott Hall. Uh, and then just to add on Meadows, you know, again, part of the reason he's asking for this extension is, as you know, he wants to move this case out of Fulton County into federal court. And so he actually wants the, you know, uh, the court to rule on this motion uh, before his surrender deadline. And so that's why he's asking for this extension, because he hopes that this case to potentially uh, throw out this case and move it to federal court will be heard first before he has to surrender. But again, the district attorney is saying, I'm not playing that. You have to negotiate with me on the terms of bond either Wednesday or Thursday. Otherwise, again, she will file an arrest warrant. So as far as the other defendants right now, we're under the impression uh, that most of them will comply. Jenna Ellis, for instance, uh, one of those who uh, has a bond arrangement today, along with about five other individuals. So this process is moving uh, relatively swiftly, Scott. Just a fire hose of activity there at that courthouse and that jail. Nicole Killian from Atlanta, thank you very much. You bet.
While Donald Trump won't be in attendance tomorrow night at the debate in Milwaukee, next, longtime Democratic political strategist James Carville joins us to explain how the other candidates on stage should strategize. A few months ago, when you were asked what's the biggest geopolitical threat facing America, you said Russia. Not Al-Qaeda, you said Russia. In the 1980s or now, calling to ask for their foreign policy back. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit, for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. Welcome back to America Decides. Two of the more memorable debate moments from former Presidents Obama and Reagan. Tomorrow night, eight GOP candidates meet in Milwaukee for the first Republican primary debate of this season. James Carville joins us now, longtime Democratic political consultant who notably was chief strategist on President Clinton's 1992 campaign. James, we appreciate the time. You know how, how to prep somebody for a multi-person debate where the <laughs> bandwidth and the airtime is narrow. How does somebody stand out when there's seven people next to him? I got a cheat sheet right here. So first, you, you assume that 40 minutes is going to be taken up by introductions, administrative stuff, questions, et cetera, et cetera. This might be a little, uh, uh, little they're not going to have opening question statements, so you might have a little bit more time. You got eight candidates, so, so if you divide eight into 72, which is 60 percent of 120, you get nine minutes. Let's figure this time you might get 11. All right, that's it. To, to just be careful. It's you, it's not 120 minutes, and I've broken it down to A, B, C. All right, A, answer the question. B, attack Biden. C, state your position clearly. So if you ask about abortion, say, I, my position is simply this. I want a federal ban of all abortions after 15 months. Under the Biden administration, you could hardly blame people for not having children with staggering runaway historical inflation with Hunter Biden on an international crime spree and board, porous open borders or whatever it is, whatever stupid thing they're going to say. And then state your position very clearly. And, you know, I'm for, you know, sealing off the border. I'm for dealing with, with whatever it is. All right. Whatever cockamamie stuff that they come up with. And my final piece of advice, and this is big, it's the cutaways. All right. The camera never, there's always going to be a camera on you. So whenever someone else is talking, they if you're grimacing or you're doing something or you're fidgeting around, that's going to pick you up and that's going to be that. Don't forget the cutaways. I mean, my other advice, don't over-prepare. Don't over-prepare. You got 11 minutes. Be sure you use them right. This is Will after you... doing 100 debate preps nationally and internationally in my life. Well, how do you prep somebody? For... Simple it is. I'm sorry. How do you prep somebody to interject in an eight-person debate? Because you got to try to find your own airtime where it may not otherwise exist, but you also don't want to look like you're being overly aggressive or, I'm sorry, right. in, a, in a party primary, rude to other Republicans. So you get it, somebody interrupts you. You're speaking. You say, I, excuse me for speaking while, <laughs> while you're interrupting me. And, and, you know, then just say, this is something that, you know, the liberal woke Democrats do. They feel, they feel like they can be rude and interrupt anybody. Just, you know, hide behind. You can't think of anything else. Just hide behind progressive or just say woke or some inane word that they use. But, but the point is, people are going to notice that you're being interrupted. And, you know, frankly, if I had as little to say as my opponent had in his previous answer, I would try to interrupt me and say something, too. I mean, you just practice your one-liners and you have to practice timing. Timing is everything. And it's particularly everything when you got 11 minutes. But, but wait for somebody to interrupt you. And then when they interrupt you, just cold cock them. Boom. And, and you can do that. And, and you know, some, they're going to be doing different things. But you, you get to play, too, not just them. For some number of Americans, this whole exercise is rendered moot by Trump not being there. Does this open the opportunity or open the door for President Biden to say, I'm not debating you if you're the Republican nominee next fall? I guess it does. It, you know, the whole debate thing and the debate commission, which I, I can't stand, uh, 
but it's probably going to be rethought. And Trump says he's not going to debate. And, you know, he's a thousand pound gorilla in the whole affair. But, you know, you have all these stupid commentators saying he owes it to the American people to debate as if Trump has ever thought about any obligation to the American people. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. He doesn't care. But yeah, and of course, Biden may not want to debate. And it, it, the whole politics of debate has, has changed pretty pretty drastically over the years. And I don't even know if, how necessary it is. And the truth of the matter is that general election presidential debates are, are joint press conferences. They're not really debates. So I, I, I but, you know, we'll see where it goes. But, and, you know, Trump will ward over the night like everything else. And, you know, and they're going to be looking. The best way to have a breakout moment is where people say, you know, that that person makes, you know, makes some sense. Or, I, you know, because you're auditioning. But the main thing you're auditioning for is these Republicans going to be looking at you saying, can this guy, assuming, you know, that Trump faces inevitable, uh, and becomes a nominee, can he carry the banner of the party? And that's what they, I think a lot of those voters are going to be looking for tomorrow night. And, and you can do it pretty simply. Don't overthink Don't you know? Don't overthink it. If the Biden campaign is going to run some ads. They're going to have some surrogates on the ground in Milwaukee to respond to what Republicans say tomorrow. But the bigger question to me is, James, is, is the president sitting out too much right now? Should he be campaigning more aggressively? Is he running a rose garden strategy where you do a few presidential events and keep quiet otherwise? Is, should should he be doing uh, that? Or do you think he is doing that? Well, first of all, he didn't have to do much in 2020 because he was protected by COVID. I thought to my maybe I'm. It seems like they're getting a little more aggressive. They're trying to promote dynamics. They're trying to put him out a little bit more. I think they're being a little more aggressive, putting people out. Uh, so far, his numbers have not moved, and if, if in, you know they do have a heck of a case to make, that you know, and he he makes a, an economic case. But if these numbers don't start moving uh, here pretty soon, people are going to going to get very very nervous. And you know, we got a huge uh, statewide uh, legislative races coming up in Virginia in November, and if his numbers are still there, it be a great bit, a great deal of nervousness. What do you do if the numbers don't move, if you're a Democratic strategist? I guess <laughs> you try to keep moving them. And they point out that his numbers were, you know, that Reagan had terrible numbers in August of uh, 1983. Uh, Clinton had, didn't have great numbers in August of 1993, yeah, or uh, I guess it was 95. And that Obama didn't have great numbers in August of 2011. But it, uh, pretty soon, these numbers need to start moving to give people some some sense of comfort. But right now, I don't see any evidence they are. Is the age is the age issue more prominent than people think it is? Is the age issue bigger uh, as a threat than people think it is? It's a big issue. I mean, it's a, people talk about it. There's not, and you can't do anything about it. And I certainly can't come on Scott McFarlane and say that you know they're talking about phony issues and need to pivot to a real issue. I, I think Americans think it's. A real issue, but I think that dealing with it is, is, is best they can. He, you know, he got that historic agreement between Japan and South Korea, and uh, you know, the White House. What you can say is, is look at what he's doing, and you know, look at his record, and forget about his age. But it's an issue that, that they're just not going away. And you do any, any focus group; it's one of the first thing that pops up. And the only answer that I can think of is just plow through it. We'll see how much, if at all, this Republican primary debate resonates without the front runner tomorrow. But for the guidance you've offered, James Carville, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Scott. That does it for today. We thank you for watching your streaming CBS News.